Hello, hello, this is Jonathan and you're listening to the Johnny Talks Podcast, the place where we help you achieve your financial goals. Hola amigos, hope you're having a great day wherever you are. And if you're a new listener to the show, special warm welcome to you. I really appreciate you tuning into the show. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. I appreciate it even more. In today's episode, we will speak to my friend Chris from Saturday Financial. A popular topic on many blogs and podcasts, and here as well actually, are the stories of how people quit their job to become entrepreneurs or even to retire in some cases. When people have accumulated enough resources, they can fire, so become financially independent and retire early. Now, between you and I, I also think that it is possible to enjoy a fulfilling career in a traditional 9-to-5 job. And to me, entrepreneurship is not for everyone neither. As I reached out on social media to find someone that agreed with that view, I met my new friend Chris, who was willing to share how he is thriving in his current role and how managing his finances has been key during his career. Chris will share his career path with us, going from a job he hated to the current role he is passionate about, and he will also provide us with excellent advice on making the best out of our professional careers. This episode is for you if you are thinking about your next career move and or if you wonder if the solution to a more fulfilling path is entrepreneurship. So without further ado, let's hear the interview. Hello, Chris. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great, Jonathan. I'm just so excited to talk to you. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Me too, uh, Chris, because you have... Um, We, you will bring a unique perspective on uh, the podcast, something we haven't spoken about, because we will talk about enjoying your nine to five job and thriving. Because usually we have had some guests here on the show that want to quit their job and they made the move to start a new venture, start on their own, and as well people who simply gathered enough money to, to leave. Uh, but here I wanted as well to have another perspective because Uh, nine to five jobs to me, it's fine as long as they bring you happiness or certain fulfillment. I never said uh, to anyone, quit your job unless it's a bad situation. I mean, I'm all for it. But nevertheless, I want to hear your perspective, Chris. So, Chris, maybe you can introduce yourself uh, briefly and tell us, yeah, what's your job, actually? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I gotta say, I, I fully agree with everything you just said there that, um, you know, I would never tell somebody, you have to stay in your nine to five. Just like you would never tell anybody, you have to go leave your job um, in order to be happy. Uh, really, at the end of the day, um, I think we're all wired differently. Uh, we all have different goals, different things that we want to work on, different things that we want to achieve. And I think in the personal finance space, especially the financial independence circles, there's a lot of focus on leveraging money to escape a job or to escape the need to work, mm -hmm. which I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with that. I think it's great to build up that, that financial freedom. But I think there's a lot of people in the financial independence circles who don't realize that they could be leveraging their same financial discipline that they're focused on a goal that's 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out. They could be leveraging those financial habits along with just having a little bit of uh, direction and focus and uh, what they want to do with their career and find that they can actually enjoy the path mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot more. Maybe that path would slow down from a 10-year goal to a 15-year goal. But if you're, if you're really leaning into work and you're being able to find work that you enjoy and that lights you up, then that 15 years is going to be much more enjoyable than a 10-year race to reach uh, you know, an arbitrary financial number where then you can quit work and never have to work again. So um, I'm really excited to, to dive into this conversation today. And as you mentioned, um, I am someone, I, I work in a nine to five that I happen to enjoy um, a whole lot. Um, <laughs> you I'm, happen I'm not going to enjoy, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll say I happen to enjoy it, but it's also um, a, a lot of that is by design. I didn't just happen to land there, um, but I do. I enjoy it a lot. I'm, I'm not going to claim that, that Any situation in life, wh whether it's my current nine to five or even early retirement for a lot of people, no situation is 100% perfect all the time, puppies and rainbows. Um, but I will say that with a lot of you know intentional decision making throughout the years, I've been able to, to land in a job um, that I really do enjoy. I, I get to work with people that I enjoy. And it's, it's taken some time to get there. But currently, I work for HR mm -hmm. um, in a nonprofit. 
And I just love getting to go to work every day, knowing that whatever task I'm doing is working toward uh, an overall mission that that I believe in. Um, and also know that I'm getting to, in some small way, help people um, find work that aligns with their values. Um, so that that's my nine to five. I'm also passionate about, just like yourself and probably many other guests on your podcast, I'm passionate about personal finance myself. I love uh, helping people, um, you know, to, to leverage um, their financial habits and to find the right financial habits so that they can really end up living a life that they are enjoying. And, and the word that you used, I like that a lot, that they can thrive, you know, wherever mm-hmm. they are, not, not just have a plan to thrive 10 years from now, but to be able to thrive and what they're doing on a daily basis, you know, beginning with, with the present moment. And um, so, yeah, th- that's where I am now. It was not always that way. And in, in fact, uh, it was just over nine years ago now, I started what was the worst job of, of my life at that point. So <laughs> I can definitely identify with anyone who might be listening right now and saying, you know what, I, I can't, I don't know if I can go another week, much less another day. And, and the word thrive, like doesn't really describe my situation at all right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I can identify with that as well. And, and, uh, I know that there's a wide spectrum of where people might be currently. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited to, to you know, share about the fact that it doesn't have to be escaping a nine to five. Okay, very good. Uh, Chris, maybe let's start with the job you have now. You say, you, you say that an important thing that I like to hear is that you say, look, I'm contributing every day because I believe in the mission of the company and I'm helping people uh, as well. I mean, the, since you work in HR, I guess you, you talk with uh, various people um, in the company and maybe externally, and then you help them define a bit the purpose of their career, or uh, at least in, in that company. Can you tell us a little bit how that works, how, what you concretely do? How do you do that? Uh, just yeah. to understand a bit your tasks. Yeah, sure. So I'll just break down at, at a high level for the last four years or so. Mm-hmm. I've been specifically in the HR department for the nonprofit I work for. And I've actually, in that four years, I've held like three different roles. <laughs> so um, I've, I've gotten a, a wide variety of experience. Uh, most recently, I've actually been focusing on a new challenge for a little bit over a year now where I'm working on HR systems, which is you know helping the, the system that we have as an organization to run as smoothly as possible. This is like the, the IT type system okay. that yeah. stores all of our, our employee data um, and really just helps things to run smoothly. So most recently, I'm just focused on that, knowing that if I go in and I do good work every day, I work as a as a teammate with the people around me to try to solve problems that are arising, then I know that that is making someone else's day just a little bit easier, just a little bit less user frustration mm-hmm. um, with, with the system that they're using. My role right before that, I was focused on learning and development within the organization. And so that's where you know I had the privilege of, in an official capacity, um, at times getting to work with people and, and work with department leaders to say, how can we help get the right people in the right seats? Like if you think of the analogy, like as an organization, as a company, if you're headed on a journey, you're heading toward a, a mission or, or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, maybe you're trying to sell a great product and get that into people's hands to make their lives better. Uh, maybe you're a nonprofit and, and you have another mission, but whatever you're doing, if you work together as a team and say, how do we get the right people in the right seat on this bus? We're all headed there together. But if we can leverage each one of our own strengths, recognize our weaknesses, work together as a team and be able to, we're never going to end up in a perfect situation where everyone's like, you know what? Every single moment of my day, I get to do exactly what I love. (laughs) Um, You know, that's part of the nature of work and, and the world that we live in is that we have the, the world is full of uh, brokenness and challenges and so part of the the joy that we get in our work is is going through that challenge and through the difficult moment together um, and being able to solve a problem so you know that, that's a, a little bit of what i've been able to do professionally is you know try to say every day when i show up when when the team that i'm with is showing up to work together how can we pull together to make our own lives a little bit better um, mm-hmm. and how can we uh, work together towards to, the vision. You know, it, yeah, towards the vision, to, towards uh, the mission or wh- whatever the common goal is that we have. Let's just try to have the best attitude we can about it, you know, whatever this day holds for us mm-hmm. and, and let's move forward. 
Yeah, no, that's good. And and of course, it requires a, a solid vision or at least a good communication of the vision and the mission of the company by the management or whoever's at the top to the employees. I think that's the, then the crucial thing here because I've seen in some organizations, and this could be a frustration for some listeners, that sometimes this vision and this mission is not communicated properly. So then this creates then confusion because people do not know exactly what they need to work towards. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And a, a lot of it does depend on, you know, slowly and surely either finding the right organization that, that is a good fit for you, or perhaps if you're in an organization that, that is good, but not perfect, you know, leveraging whatever amount of influence, even if it's just the tiniest amount of influence you have, whether you realize it or not, you have in your position, you have influence over the people around you. Whether or not you have a job title that says you're influencing others, you as a human being have the ability by the way that you approach your job, the attitude that you have, and the the idea of coming in to serve those around you. It doesn't matter if they're peers on your team, if it's your direct reports, maybe it's the, the person supervising you. If you come in and say, I have an attitude, I'm ready to, to serve today, um, then you can positively influence others. And that can make its way up the chain of command. Now, I'm not I'm not saying that uh, you always need to stay at the organization where you are and, and change from within, but just saying that wherever you are sitting in your current career uh, at this point, then you can choose to make both long-term decisions that are good and are going to help you and daily decisions to say, uh, yes, I'm going to make the most of the situation I'm in right now, and I'm going to try to influence up and make this place a better place to work and help you know, I'm going to clearly respectfully communicate to my manager and his manager or her manager and say, you know, I, I think that our, our organization's goals are, are very good, uh, but they're not being communicated where well, there's too much emphasis being placed on, for example, every, everyone's talking from senior management about shareholder value, shareholder value. Well, how do we create shareholder value? We get a good product into people's hands that's going to improve their lives. And so, you know, just, just really having that attitude and, and saying, what, what can I do with the little bit of influence I have to make, you know, my world, the, the little circle of what I can control, what can I do today to make it better? No, oh, very good, Chris. Uh, no, I, I really, uh, really like that. And because sometimes I've seen and I've heard, oh, yes, but, you know, I'm, a, I don't know what, I'm a junior uh, legal Council, I'm a junior this, or I'm a, I'm not a VP senior, so I don't know. Whatever I do, it's not going to be listened to. But yeah, I agree with the philosophy. Even if it's not, at least build on those a circle of small circle of influence, daily actions, long term planning, and maybe this in the will not make a difference. I don't know, maybe in the immediate uh, six months, but who knows in the long run? And still, it's always good for yourself to work on those things to make your life easier, to learn as well, to get out of your comfort zone little by little, but working towards that mission, of course. So, uh, no, I really enjoy it. And Chris, maybe let's um, roll back nine years ago because you talk about your current role uh, with passion, which is great to hear. But then nine years ago, that was not the case. So what was going on? <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> that was not the case at all. And uh, I'll back up just a little bit further than that to say, mm -hmm. You know, thankfully, from a, a relatively young age, I was able to make a, a decision in my life and say, you know what, I'm not going to chase money. Now, I've always, since I was a very young kid, like I, I loved personal finance. I, I love math. I love people. I love seeing how all of that works together. And I've just been probably just like yourself, right? Um, just very weirdly wired toward the numbers and, and how it all works together. And it's just amazing that you know, money earns interest and it just, you know, not, not that much these days, but back when I was a kid anyway, it was like, you just have money sitting in a savings account and it, it's earning money for you. That's amazing. And so thankfully with, with all of that coming together, even when I was in uh, high school, what we call it here in the States, uh, before I was even having to make choices about what my career were, I had a grounding to say, I'm not going to chase money because if I figure the money thing out, then I can leverage that to try to do work that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I started out that way. Um, I went to college with that idea. After college, I got to go uh, serve with a nonprofit overseas for a couple of years, which was great. Again, highs and lows and no situation is ever perfect. Like the idea that 
I'm going to, you know, find the right thing and then jump in. And every day I'm going to wake up just completely happy. It is never, uh, you're never going to get that from your work. But I will say, you know, I was able to do that early on in my career. And I came to a point where I started to let that personal finance side of it slip just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I've been good with my money. I've got a good amount saved up. I'm in my early 20s at this point. And so I'm going to just really not worry about the money almost at all. And I'm just going to enjoy what I'm doing. And I'm going to take my money and I'm going to go study something that I want to study just for personal growth. And I'm just going to focus on that. I'm not going to focus on growing in my career or anything at all. Mm -hmm. And I let the pendulum swing too much at that point. And I ended up at a point where, because I had neglected paying attention to my money, suddenly I found myself for the first time in my life needing money. And for the first time in my life, uh, and this was just over nine years ago, I had to make a career decision that was driven by money. And I said, I have to go find a job that's paying more. I have to work more hours than I'm working now Mm -hmm. because for the last year and a half, two years, I have not prioritized that at, at all. And I've just let it slip. And so that's how I found myself in this situation just over nine years ago. I was like, I need to take, and I'm not going to take just, just any job, but the next reasonable full-time job that comes available, I'm going to have to take it. And that was a result of my decisions. It was a consequence of my decisions. So I took that job. And I just want to say, again, for anyone who, if, if you're still listening to the podcast at this point, and even, even though you're saying nine to five, like, my current nine to five is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> I, I can absolutely identify with where you, and I'm not going to say this is the worst job in the world. I know there were worse ones, but at least from a uh, desk job type perspective, this might be close to it. And, and here's what I was doing a little over nine years ago. I got to work for a company that was essentially a third party HR hotline for employees to call and report workplace concerns that they had. So the company I was working for, they had clients all over the world in various industries, and their clients were the companies, right? And then, so the company would pay my company so that we could serve as a third party, you know, somewhat of a a neutral hotline that people could call and report tough things that were going on in their job. Okay, so you you hear all the, the bad stories then? Exactly. And, and this is a day in and day out. And I, I stayed in that job for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Day in and day out, I was having conversation after conversation with people who were having their worst day at work <laughs> and and probably the last five years, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they might have had something boiling up inside of them, whether it be for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Uh, regardless, this is like the worst day that they're having in five years. And it's finally gotten bad enough that they're going to pick up the phone and they're going to call that third party hotline so that they can report their concerns. And and like I said, this was we had people calling in from around the globe, all different types of industries, blue collar, white collar, you name it. And we were were talking with these people. We would help them create, you know, a, a good, solid, factual report of what was going on. But in order to do that, we, we had to have those conversations. Mm-hmm. And I have to say that work that I was doing deeply affected my view of work at both at the time and really for, for at least a couple of years after that job, I had this view of work. And I, I can imagine that many people who are uh, reading financial independence type blogs can maybe are identifying with this to say, I had this view of work that work is something that needs to be escaped from. And that's where I was nine years ago and really for, for several years after that. And I had to slowly build my, my career, build my, my own vision and my own attitude to realize that that's not necessarily true. Work is actually something that we can get great fulfillment out of. Mm-hmm. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the last person to stand up and say, like, work is, is going to be the ultimate purpose in our, in our life necessarily. But I will say that work by design, it's, it's not necessarily going to be easy, but it can be very, very good. Okay. And then, but what's interesting is that, okay, you had this one year and a half kind of horrible <laughs> experience. I mean, it was not fantastic. It wasn't a fantastic job. I mean, you, you hear only people that complain and uh, difficult situations at work. So it's maybe not the pleasance uh, of it all. But, but then uh, in the end, it still kind of helped you 
to think about to in your thought process about your career so in a way it's it's a shaped uh, what you it shaped your career uh, so yeah. to speak so yeah. in the end it's okay it's it was maybe difficult in the moment but in the way that that experience can help you move forward and talking about moving forward so how did you change job and how did you come to um slowly transition to a uh, yeah a work that you enjoy today i mean in during those nine years what happened with your career yeah that's that's a great question and i would say that it started with the present moment at the time mm -hmm. right so um now i did know that sometimes in order to make the right decisions we have to look to the future and do the best that we can to envision you know the, the type of life that we want and, and what we want to be doing but what i realized at the time was you know what i have to own the situation that I'm in right now. I have to, number one, I have to look at the positives. The nature of that work was very difficult. Just talking to people who were, in, in a lot of cases, rightfully so, complaining day in and day out, that that was very draining on on myself, on my spirit. But to say, what, what are the good things about this job? Okay, number one, I'm learning a lot. Like I get to sit on the other side of the phone and get small little insights into all kinds of industries from all over the world. Number two, as, as difficult as the nature of that work was, I, I was uh, very blessed to have good people around me for the most part, like mm -hmm. my supervisors and their supervisors and managers. They were good people who were not making the work any more difficult than it had to be, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we had a job to do and we had to do it well. We had to do it quickly. We had to do it efficiently, but they were good people to work with. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take my current situation and I'm going to learn what I can and I'm going to build good habits. And so I'm going to approach every day. And again, this was not easy at the time. But I'm going to try to go in every day. I'm going to do the best job that I can. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to take this one day at a time. And then from there, I'm also going to keep my eyes open for other opportunities. Now, one thing I told myself, so I want to be clear, I was not in a toxic work environment in the sense of I didn't have a boss who was uh, yelling at me and cursing at me every day or anything like that. So there are definitely situations where some people may need to get out and they may need to get out quickly. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I said, you know, this is a difficult job. It, at least it's, it's hard for me and, and for my personality. Maybe other people are thriving in that job today. But I, I said, for me, this is not where I want to be long term. But I'm going to stick this out for a minimum of one year. And I'm going to learn what I can for one year. And then at the one year mark, I really started just keeping my eyes open for opportunities and it ended up being about a year and a half before the right opportunity came. Yeah. But the, the key there was that I really, I looked at my current situation and said, I'm going to grow here. And um, there's a, a quote by, um, there's an author, his name is Aaron McHugh. And he has a book, it's called Fire Your Boss. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a good book overall. I, I wouldn't say it's uh, like like the, the best book I've, I've ever read in my life, but I really, really love the things that he has to say in that book and the concepts that he presents. And the the title of the book would make you think that what he's saying is like fire your boss, like Leave quit your job. job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like quit quit your job today and get, you know, go do something else. The grass is greener on the other side of the fence. But the the premise of the book, what he's actually saying is look, stop looking to your boss to give you career fulfillment and open the right doors for you and to make your job good. He's saying forget that you become your own boss where you are. And he actually, this is one of the quotes from the book. He says, the solution isn't always to relocate to another company. It's to renovate ourselves so that it's our best version showing up no matter the environment. And I think for, for most people, that is step one, is to look inwardly and to renovate yourself and say, I'm going to thrive where I am. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to stay here forever mm -hmm. necessarily, but I'm going to thrive where I am and I'm going to let that launch me into uh, the next step. Now, again, everything in life has nuance. And I think uh, there, there may be people who are listening to this who they just need to get out and they need to get out quick, line up something else and leave within two weeks. If that's the case, I support it 100%. Mm -hmm. But I think for most of us, the, the best path is to learn what we can, where we are, and look for the the right natural opportunity to transition. Okay, very good. Because yeah, I can imagine as well for some other topics. Huh? I mean, you mentioned the toxic environment. 
But then what if, for example, the career opportunities are limited or, uh, I don't know, politics get in the way of your career, this kind of thing. So what would you say there? Should we still, should we still behave our best and do, um, and focus on our tasks and uh, do the best we can to fulfill the vision? What, what is your, uh, perspective on this? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, that question brings a particular truth to light that there are a lot of nine to five jobs in this world. Of course, we're using the term nine to five uh, very broadly here, but yeah. it essentially, uh, we'll just call it anything that's not entrepreneurship, anything where you're coming and you're working for someone else, whether it be blue collar, white collar, whether it be a, a small company, a large company, there are a lot of those jobs that just aren't great. Maybe it's not just a matter of leadership not communicating the vision of the company well. Maybe it's the fact that that particular company doesn't have a great vision, right? And so to, to your question, I would say, yes, the answer is, again, this is assuming that it's not a toxic environment. Assuming that you are not being asked to do something unethical in your job, then I do believe that the best thing you can do is start today by doing the best that you can at that job and learning what you can from it. Even the things about that job that you don't enjoy, mm -hmm. you, can, you can learn things and you can learn skills and you can learn attitudes and you can learn habits that will serve you very, very well when you find something that is more closely aligned with your passions and, and your talents and, and your giftings. Um, so I think absolutely that, that's where it starts is today um, doing the best that I can but also looking for opportunities. And so for myself, I mentioned, you know, it ended up being about a year and a half before I left that company. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the keys about that decision was that I was, even as, as frustrating as that job was for me at times, at most of the time, <laughs> I was careful not to just run away from that company, mm -hmm. but I wanted to run toward something that was at least one step closer toward the way that I wanted to spend, you know, my day, 40 hours a week or give or take. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm making career moves that are something where I'm stepping toward the direction I want to go, not just away from the direction that I don't want to go, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Because um, so about three years ago, I was looking for uh, the job I have now, actually. I was in between the jobs. and then. I read a lot of things and, you know, I prepared um, my interviews. I look for companies. I read articles on LinkedIn and uh, Thrive Global and this kind of things. And uh, of course, there's a, a saying or a th I don't know where I read it or maybe I heard it on a podcast, whatever. But it's about, yeah, if you try to escape just to escape, you will um, end up in a job. You will take a job. Maybe that pays better. But in the end, maybe the, the situation is the same. So you will, um, you're not getting closer to what you want to achieve later on in life or in your career, you will just end up in another difficult situation. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so it's important to what right. you said to, to really think it through and not just try to escape a, a difficult situation without a, a specific purpose. I mean, if it's difficult, yeah, I'm sorry, but at least look for something better for yourself. You're doing yourself a disservice if you're not thinking it through. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And I think that decision that, that you made three years ago to be intentional about your switch um, and, and jobs at the time, I mean, I'm sure that in the last three years that you've seen the payoff from that to say, you know what, I, I landed in a situation that was overall better than the one before. Now, it still might, it might not be perfect, <laughs> um, <laughs> but at least you are one step closer to the, the type of life and the, the type of work that you would like to be doing, I, I, would, I would assume. Yeah, there, there's, it's not perfect, huh? but it's at least it's uh, better than the situation before and closer to where I want to go, definitely. Exactly. And, and if we can, in our lives, be just consistently making those decisions and those moves, and again, you might do the, the best that you can to vet a company and a position and a team that you're going to be working for, and you you think you're stepping in the right direction. You get there and two weeks later, you realize, wow, this was not uh, what was advertised. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes you there are things that are beyond your control, but you can, 
if you're intentional about your decisions, you can each step of the way, just push yourself more and more toward uh, the life that you want to live, the, the way that you want to be contributing to the world. And you just find that. And wherever you are, you, you learn and you grow in the, in the position that you're in. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is that, um, I mean, in my current job, so what I've done is that as well, I, I try to kind of do this work of seeing, okay, this is my job. I work in procurement. What do I want to do more? And I've talked to my boss several times and um, I pushed, I had to push. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Nothing comes easy, but That's just right. to, I want to work more with some development of uh, partnerships, et cetera with other companies, I mean, with suppliers. So it's something I've, um, I've started to work on. So let's see if that goes well, how that goes. But at least it's something I wanted to work for. And then he supported the idea. And then now it looks uh, like as uh, I have his trust. And then we'll see. We need to, I, I mean, I still need to develop, develop this thing. But at least the, the, some meetings have started and the machine is rolling, let's say. So at least I've yeah. tried to, it's not a complete change of my role, but at least there's more room for that part of the job and which is something I wanted. So exactly. it, it makes it a bit um, more and I mean, uh, more motivating. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more motivating. And you know, what is amazing about what you did is you, you took initiative. And so number one, I think you realized about your situation is, okay, I'm not in a toxic environment working for a horrible company. So this is somewhere where at least for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be, so I'm going to invest some time, and some uh, some energy toward trying to shape my role into something that looks a little bit more that is, is aligned with my interests and, and what I would like to be doing. And you took the initiative. You talked to your boss. You Like you said, nothing comes easy. But at the same time, we have not because we ask not. If we mm -hmm. just go into work and we say, here's my job description. Here's the way that my role has been defined. I'm just going to put my head down and I'm going to do this work then maybe nothing will change for five years. But if you go and you say, okay, number one, I'm going to do the best that I can to my abilities with my job description. And then I'm also going to look for opportunities. How can I begin contributing without stepping out of bounds and stepping outside my lane, so to speak? I'm going to, how can I begin contributing now to the type of work that I want to do? And then how can I have a conversation just like you did? How can I have a conversation with my boss to say, hey, I am thankful for the work that I get to do. I think I'm thankful for the way that I get to contribute to this company. I see an opportunity over here that I would really love to learn more about, or that maybe I think I already have some expertise that could really be of help here. And I would love if I can spend just a little bit of my time every week working on this project with, with this team or with this, this person. Um, and so I, I love what you did there. And that's, it's, it's a great move to make is just have that conversation with your boss and then Follow it up with with good, consistent action. And again, learn what you can and grow as much as you can wherever you are. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, I've always been a bit proactive in, the, in that sense. And um, I mean, not always at first, I need to analyze the situation, but I think it helps. But at least it helps, it, it can help shape a bit what you do right now. I mean, maybe eventually I will change companies. Maybe I will change job, reduce. I don't know yet. But at least I wanted to make the best of uh, of what I have now and trying to steer my career the best way I can for the long run. That's uh, what I wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one, one thing I'm noticing about your situation, obviously, you are a talented entrepreneur. Like you, ha you have a great blog with an incredible insights. You have uh, this podcast, which is you're, you're very consistent, putting out good quality content uh, here on this podcast. And so you have the entrepreneurial mindset and you are taking that to your nine to five. And I think that's what a lot of people, they miss that opportunity is just because I'm working for a company doesn't mean I can't approach this, uh, this career that I'm in or this path that I'm on right now with an entrepreneurial mindset to say, how can I help grow? Not just for myself personally, but how do I grow myself personally so that therefore I can help this organization grow towards its goals and towards its mission. And man, the, the mutual benefits that you start to see when you approach your job with that attitude, you get to grow, you get to do work that you enjoy a little bit more, and you get to help your company succeed. And there's, there's great fulfillment in that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think it's something we talked about back in the days with uh, another guest, uh, Money Mage, because he started blogging. And then he said the same thing. He said, oh, yeah, I'm starting to develop skills by blogging. And then it, it, it comes back into my work because I'm able to communicate better because I'm practicing this on the side. So it becomes a blending and additional skills that you're building on your own without noticing it at first. It's a bit unexpected, but it's a, it's a great add-on, uh, definitely. And Chris, of course, we are here uh, on the Johnny Talks podcast, so we need to talk money. I mean, we don't need to, but we like to talk money. We, we love talking money. <laughs> we love talking money. <laughs> and of course, we can build ourselves in our careers, try to transition to better jobs or better roles inside the company. But what about the money part? Because, you know, if someone leaves his job, become a successful full-time entrepreneur, in theory, there is no roof to his uh, income possibility. And this is something that, that attracts people as well, because I mentioned that somebody can maybe feel trapped or uh, feel blocked by the, I don't know, the corporate ladder, because there's already managers there and I don't know, they're roadblocked or whatever. But if you're an entrepreneur, basically, the more you sell, the more you, I mean, the more the, the company makes money, the more you make. So then there's no uh, limitations. And of course, it helps you with the uh, financial independence and financial abilities uh, or for whatever you want to do. So, for example, uh, yeah, I don't know about you, uh, how you approach this, uh, because in the end, you will, um, are, are you living paycheck to paycheck or do you save a little bit every month or how do you approach the, the, yeah, your personal finances in a nine to five job then? Yeah, absolutely. And I got to say, the, the first step, it doesn't matter whether your ultimate goal is entrepreneurship, whether your ultimate goal is to find the close to perfect nine to five for you and thrive in there for years and years. Or if your goal is, you know, neither one, like I, uh, there are people who validly want to go and pursue early retirement. And then they're at the end of the day, they're going to spend their time every week, however much they want or however little they want. They're probably going to end up volunteering their time to contribute to society in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of what your goal is, it has to start with financial discipline. And with and financial discipline begins with just simply paying attention to your money. Um, I think I, I do some personal finance consulting on the side. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I tell my clients is, look, you're going to win half the battle if all you do is just pay attention to your money. So whatever that looks like for you, setting up a budget on the front end and seeing if you met it on the back end, what I personally like to do is just track my spending. I don't even have a strict budget, but I do track my spending. I know where every dollar goes mm -hmm. and then I can look approximately once a month and say, okay, um, here's how much I spent on this, this, and this. Do I like the way that this pie chart looks? Do I think that it aligns with my values? Is it helping me reach my goals short-term, medium-term, long-term? Or do I need to make adjustments? And if I need to make adjustments, I don't beat myself up about it. I just say, hey, next month, I'm going to try to be a little bit more intentional about taking this category of, of uh, spending and try to reduce that a little bit so that I can be free to either increase it in another category or maybe to save more, to invest more, you know, whatever the case is. All of this begins, like you can't even begin to do anything that we've talked about so far. You can't shape your career in a way that's aligning with, with the direction you want to go if you're living paycheck to paycheck. Mm. You have to build that financial cushion and leverage the uh, little bit of financial freedom that you have. Um, now, maybe, again, if, I'm sure many of your listeners are probably, they, they read blogs, they're looking, they're seeing people who are, you know, million dollar net worth, <laughs> you know, $2 million net worth, and they're like, I, I don't have any of that. I could never be free. Or, or I'm years and years or decades and decades away from being free. It's like, you know, if you are somebody who has taken the time even just to listen to the Joni Talks podcast, you're ahead of most of society. And you, you can take whatever little bit of financial freedom that you've created for yourself, whatever little bit of space you've created for yourself, and start leveraging that to live the life that you want to live uh, as much as possible, you know, today. And uh, you know, it doesn't take half a million dollars, a million dollars, two million dollars to be able to have the confidence and the freedom to say, I'm going to start directing my own career. I am not going to be afraid 
to go to my boss and have that conversation just like you did to say, I, um, I'm interested in this area of what my organization is doing, and I want to uh, explore that and, and be a part of that. Because the, 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 the thing is, you know, when you, a lot of people that come on the show and they want to retire or um, start their own career, it's about as well. And something I like myself is to do things on your terms. And this, okay, this is something maybe you cannot have with the nine to five because you're always subject to your managers, the, the company, the policies, whatever changes. And maybe you can be laid off uh, tomorrow. Who knows? Right. So, and this, when you're an entrepreneur, it's not all rosy neither, but because it's even more risky, but you have more flexibility and you can do whatever you want. You can uh, go to the gym in the afternoon if you want, but then you need to work later on because in the end you, you need to make money. So what, what do you have to say about that, about that flexibility, doing work on your own terms? Isn't that something you, you're missing, uh, Chris? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great point. I think at, at the end of the day, what people need to do is really do an honest evaluation of themselves and their personalities. And there are going to be some people who are just a much better fit for pursuing their vocational interest through entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. These are people probably like yourself, people who are very self-disciplined, very driven, very organized, very passionate. And that they know that I'm going to have the discipline if I go to the gym for you know an hour, hour and a half in the afternoon, I am going to uh, plug in and and work really hard late that night, and I'm going to you know produce results because when you're not when you're an entrepreneur, like you, it's a sink or swim type of thing. You have to produce those results, and so I, you know I would I'm, I would never try to have this conversation with you and and know that you're going to share this with others. And try to tell people you have to pursue a nine to five. This is the way to uh, fulfillment is, is, you know, working with an organization. What I'm saying is in the personal finance space, I think that nine to fives get more hate than they get love. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people. And again, this it comes back to an honest evaluation of yourself and your own personality. There are a lot of people for whom a nine to five is a wonderful fit. And I'm. I'm also, I'm not saying that uh, it, you, if you're a self-disciplined person, then entrepreneurship is the way. The, the people who do well in their nine to fives are also very self-disciplined, very driven, very organized. Maybe they, they find that they just love being on a team, uh, working with others. Maybe they find that they do just really enjoy the, the stability um, that comes from knowing, okay, I'm getting a paycheck every, every two weeks. And I know that if I meet these three goals that my boss gave me this year, then I'm probably going to be eligible for, you know, relatively small, but an X percent raise mm -hmm. coming. Like, I like the predictability. Um, I like the, the the fact that there's structure here. And either path, I, I think it begins with, with knowing yourself and knowing which one's the better fit for me to have to depend on to grow my net worth, to provide for my family, to meet my financial goals. Um, to live the life that, that I was meant to live, which one of these paths is better? And realizing that you know neither one of them is is perfect. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's probably a little bit of a of a balance of the two because, like you mentioned, a nine to five is not something that you can depend. Just because it's predictable doesn't mean that your prediction is going to be correct. It could be tomorrow. It could be two months from now mm -hmm. that the organization says we need to cut costs. And the best way we can cut costs is by, you know, eliminating uh, positions. And so even though, you know, Mike or Jessica over here is really doing a great job, the position that, that they are in is no longer a position that serves our organization well from a financial perspective. So we're going to cut that position. Mm -hmm. That's a reality. And so you, you uh, just coming back to what we talked about, of it all begins with financial discipline and and building up a cushion and being flexible to say, you know, if I needed to pick up entrepreneurship for a while, or maybe I'm going to do it on the side just as a, a little bit of a supplement to what my primary focus is my nine to five, but I'm going to do something that I really enjoy on the side. And I'm going to, I'm going to crush it at both of them. I'm going to do uh, really good work for you know, maybe it's six hours a week. I'm going to do really good work for six hours a week on my passion. 
and I'm going to do really good work for 40 to 45 hours a week for my organization. And it's about building out uh, insurance for yourself and, and building out you know, the, the ability to thrive no matter what the future holds. Yeah, in the end, um, you know, I've been doing, of course, some self-reflection around this about leaving a job, changing jobs, being more flexible, and as well, okay, this podcast is a bit um, the entrepreneurial side of myself, but in the end, what is, what is important to me is not necessarily to quit my job and not have a boss. It's to do something I, I like. It doesn't yeah. matter if I have a job or, or, or not, because, for example, I can tell you, uh, and I did this for a, a guy I'm an affiliate with, uh, it's Ivan on Tech, it's about blockchain courses, and one day he asked me, oh yeah, can you do this PDF for us? It's uh, to help with the, the courses. And I was like, you know, but I like the guy. So I was just excited. I just say, oh yeah, of course, I'm happy to contribute to the, to the academy. So I made a PDF and then I sent to them and then they, you know, I just did it in one hour. It was very simple and quick, but it just, it's a simple thing. And, you know, if my boss asked me to do this same PDF, I would be pissed because, oh, <laughs> come on, I'm not paid for that. But then the other guy, okay, he asked me and, you know, because I am passionate about this, uh, this, uh, academy and okay, the, the, this guy, I mean, I think he, he's, uh, an inspiration and, uh, in the blockchain space and it's, yeah, I was just happy to do it. So, so really it's, it's, it's all a matter of doing what you like for who you like with whom you like. I don't know. It's, uh, in the end, I don't, I said it to, in another podcast, you know, maybe I will work a bit less at my job in a few years. I don't know, depending on how things go financially, but it's more, I want to build flexibility, not necessarily leave or quit, but just see, maybe I like a bit of both. Maybe I will switch over to completely one. I don't know. Yes. But at least what I want to achieve is to do something every day that, that I enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that word that you mentioned, flexibility is so key and just not depending on any one thing, like not foolishly thinking that a nine to five is going to be there for you forever, but mm -hmm. building up a, not only a strong emergency fund, but also a strong net worth filled with good, wise investments so that if something happens, you don't have to freak out. And you do, even if, you know, let, let's be honest, for a lot of people, especially people raising families, you know, having a, a side hustle, even one that you really enjoy, can be difficult with the demands of a nine to five. So mm -hmm. maybe your uh, your defense, your insurance, so to speak, depending on the person, maybe it's building up a, a side business or maybe it's just building up a really, really solid net worth so that if something happens, then you can say, you know what, I have some time and some freedom and to your word, some flexibility to take my time and find what's the next step for me. Mm -hmm. And then another leg, it doesn't matter whether you're leaning in and crushing it in your nine to five, whether you are building up a, a side business or both. You, if you're doing either one of those things or both, you're building skills. And those skills w will also serve as an insurance policy that if things get really bad, if the unforeseeable happens, then I know that because I did my best every day, I built good habits and I learned as I went and, uh, you know, I accomplished uh, so much every day, you know, that over the course of the years, suddenly I have lots of knowledge. I have lots of uh, skills. I have lots of ways that I can contribute. Not only do I have a nice emergency fund, not only do I have a, a small business side hustle, but I also have the ability to go and contribute in a number of different ways to society. And if I can contribute and provide value to people, whatever the avenue, whether it's working for someone else or working for myself, if I can provide value to people, then I'm not going to need to worry about where my next meal is coming from or even or where my meal one year from now is coming from. I know I can be free to to live and do the work that I'm interested in and that I'm passionate about, whatever avenue that takes, um, because I had financial discipline, I can be free to do that and I can have the flexibility to do that. Oh, fantastic, uh, Chris. I really like it. And uh, yeah, Chris, uh, I think we've come at the end of the show. And uh, I really want to thank you for uh, sharing your insights. I think it was very helpful. And I think it will uh, hopefully give some good inspiration for the, the listeners who may or may not be in difficult situation at, uh, at their careers. But since careers are unpredictable, maybe this can be uh, of a, we hope that this conversation can be of help. 
as well. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> that was appreciated. And uh, Chris, as you know, we have our uh, three quick fire questions at uh, each end of the show. So um, are you ready for them? Oh, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, good. So uh, we didn't really talk about it, but um, what is the best investment you've made so far, uh, Chris? Oh, man, for me personally, I have to say that I'm just a big fan of index funds. I'm sure your listeners have probably heard about this before. Yes. <laughs> um, but personally, the best investment is investing in a wide, broad spectrum of things in a very easy manner. Mm -hmm. Now, I again, I, I grew up loving personal finance like you. It's just I can't help but think about this stuff and read about this stuff and research this stuff. So there was a time in my life where I was investing a lot of time and picking um, to the best of my ability individual stocks. And, you know, I had some winners. I had some losers. At the end of the day, I was spending a lot of time. And I think this is true of a lot of people who trade individual stocks, um, especially with a large percentage of their portfolio. They probably don't take the time to track that against an index like the S&P 500, for example. Um, they just say, hey, I'm, I'm up. 12% uh, this year. I think I'm doing really good. Where if they would take the time to say, well, how much is the S&P up this year? Oh, the s and is up 18%. 12% uh, is not so impressive when you could have had your money in a passive index fund earning 18%. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it's, it's hard to beat the simplicity of an index fund. And my philosophy, regardless of what I'm investing in, is look, if I get money that I know that I'm not going to need in the short term in the next month, or in the medium term in the next year or two for a big purchase that I might have. If I get money that I don't need for one of those two goals, I'm going to invest that immediately in my preferred mix of index funds. Mm -hmm. And so I invest it as soon as I have it. And I know that I'm not going to take that out until I need it, which will hopefully be many, many years down the road. And for me, that, that's, that's the winning investment philosophy that I have found to work well for me and for my family. And I must say that... Um... Okay, I, I do individual stocks. I like them. I like dividends. And um, I have a few companies, but now I'm leaning not towards only index funds, but I want to limit the number of, of individual stocks I have as well. So what I do is I continue contributing to those individual stocks because I think there are some companies that will run for a long time. Like it's mostly blue chips. And I do as well the, the passive index funds as well, just to... Because I like both and I like the businesses, but but yeah, in, in the end, I don't want to expand too much uh, on, uh, because, you know, sometimes people ask me, listeners or even colleagues at work, hey, what about this stock? Hey, did you look at this? And then in the end, I'm like, yeah, okay, uh, I can, I don't have time to spend on this because in the end, I, I don't want to, to spend my time only thinking about the next big thing. Sure, I might yeah. miss out, but okay, yeah. <laughs> At yeah, some point, right. you cannot uh, pick only winners. You will pick losers as well if you think like this. And the, the index fund is great. It is, it's a great place. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I fully support pe people like yourself who enjoy it, who actually get satisfaction out of the time that they're spending researching. I say, have at it, absolutely, and go and take a percentage of your portfolio, whatever's comfortable for you and your situation, take a percentage and go and research and, and invest. But I, uh, yeah, personally, for me and my family, it, uh, we love index funds. And I do think that index funds are the backbone of any good strategy. Like you, you've got to have that mixed in somewhere, yeah. um, in, in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then Chris, I'm uh, moving on to the next question. What is a book you can um, recommend to anyone? And it does not need to be a financial book. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. I think for me, it, it has to be a tie at this point. So one book that's financial and one book that's not financially. Uh, Morgan Housel's "The Psychology of Money" is just a great book. It just came out in the in the last year or so, and and I noticed on your blog, I believe you have that featured as like the book of the month right now, at least at the time of recording. And um, it is it's it's such a good book. I, I love the way that Morgan writes. I love his voice, and he just has so many good insights. Yeah, it's it's not uh, it's not a rocket science technical book that's going to give you all the keys to um, exactly what you need to do. But it's it's a great big picture map that if you can read it and and uh, apply it to your life, uh, you're going to win with money, no, hands down. Yes, and I um, just before we move on to the non financial book, no, I read it uh, myself. So um, as I told you offline, so I read it two weeks ago. So just before the end of the year. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I was so amazed by this book because it's, um, we said it before, I mean, you and I offline that, you know, we, we read a lot of personal finance content. So sometimes I read it, but I, I found some tweets or whatever it was from him or on Instagram. And it was insightful. I was like, oh, this guy is good. And then I saw this book and I think people were talking about it. And then I bought it and I was like reading it without too much expectation. And then I was like, wow, this is amazing. It's a, it's a great book because, yeah, it's really about the mindset of money. It's not, as you said, it's not the, the technical bits like the savings rate or the, I don't know what, invest in this index fund or that index fund. It's not a technical approach. It's the mindset and it's about career. As we talked about today, it's about money essentially, but it's a lot of it's about a lot of things about risk taking, and, and it covers a lot of ground. And it's um, no, it's br- brilliantly written. It's complex topic, but broken down very simply, and it's uh, yeah, it, it's digestible. And uh, yeah, I recommend it to everybody as well, Chris. A good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with, with everything you said. Um, so yeah, if, if anyone's looking for a, a book that's uh, related to money, that's it, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And then the one that I think is kind of tied in my mind, it's not particularly a financial book, but it does uh, apply well to finances, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there's one book that's going to help someone toward building the life that, that they want on a day-to-day basis... Um, I think Atomic Habits is it. And James Clear, he's just an incredibly talented writer. Um, He has so many good insights and it's very practical. If someone takes that book and not only reads it, but begins applying the the principles, they're going to find themselves uh, almost immediately in uh, a life that is better than what they had uh, before they picked up that book. That's for sure. Oh, yes. I I love this one as well. So (laughs) another excellent suggestion. (laughs) I will not comment on it. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it's an excellent uh, topic. Yeah, I really love this book as well. So um, yeah, third question, Chris. Yeah, what is the best purchase you've made for under $100? Oh, that, that's a great question as well. Um, I would say, and this is building a little bit off of the Atomic Habits book. Uh, one of the ways in which I applied the book, I bought a, a moleskin journal for uh, $15. And I, I am using that to track my habits. Um, as well as to map out, you know, my my highest priority goals uh, for that day, or, or really not so much goals as like, w- what is the habit that I want to accomplish today? Or, you know, what are the habits that I've laid out that I want to make sure that I've, I'm doing every day? And what does that look like for today? Um, and so I have a, a one page per day that I, I run through and it helps to to lead my day and make sure that I'm uh, living moment to moment and the, the way that I want to be. Um, and then from there, I also have like a, a monthly tracking page set up um, that I go and I, and I track and just to have that visual representation of how well or not I'm living up to the habits that are going to make the days, the days that I want to live, which is then going to make my life the life that I want to live. Um, so, yeah, that that fifteen dollar journal, uh, I would say, is, is going to have uh, dividends for myself uh, for years and years to come. OK, yeah, very good. And uh, yeah, it's uh... Sounds great and um, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. And uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. But um, yeah, if people want to know more about you, I think you have a website and you're as well on social media. That's how we met. So where can people find you, Chris? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So I, I do have a website. It is uh, SaturdayFinancial.org. So just the word Saturday, the word financial.org. Um, and so I, I've got a site there if anyone wants to go and uh, sign up, uh, receive some emails from me from time to time. That's a great place to uh, connect with me. You can also uh, find my social media accounts on the website. Um, I'm most active on Twitter. Um, so if anyone wants to uh, jump on Twitter, I'd love to to meet you, start up some conversations there. Um, my handle there is at Chris B underscore finance. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's Chris, C-H-R-I-S. Uh, the letter B, like boy, underscore finance. Okay, good. And I'll link it anyway in the show notes so uh, people can uh, find you. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, I'd love to, love to connect with anybody who, who uh, like me, like yourself, loves to, to talk about money and how it can improve our lives. Would love to connect with people and 
Um, Jonathan, I just got to say, this, this has been such a fun conversation. Thanks so much for having me on and and uh, letting me share a little bit and, and learn from you. And um, just really uh, just an incredible time. Yeah, it was my pleasure, Chris. Uh, great to have you on. Uh, glad we connected and uh, I think it's, uh, it's a great conversation as well. I'm, I'm excited to, to release it soon. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you learned something from it. And if you find it useful, make sure you share it with a friend or rate the show in the podcast app. I left you a link in the show notes so you can uh, rate the show. And before we head off, let's go through the key takeaways for today. Number one, you can leverage good financial habits like tracking expenses, saving and investing your money while you are in your 9 to 5. The path to financial independence could be slower than if you are running your own company and making more money, but it is as well about enjoying the journey. And a few uh, tips to help you there. Pay attention to your money. This will help you win half the battle already, as Chris said. Leverage the little financial freedom you have to live the life you want today. And then as well, build a solid emergency fund, increase your net worth, so you're prepared for any unforeseen situation. Number two, and I really like this one, whatever the role or seniority in your company, you have influence over the people around you with your approach and your attitude. So be ready to serve and influence positively. Ask yourself, what can I do with my influence to make my work better? Number three, whatever the situation, own the situation you are in, learn what you can, take the lessons of your current job, go in every day to do the best job you can, but keep your eyes open for other opportunities. And about those opportunities, look for a better one. Don't simply look at escaping a difficult situation. Number four, and it's an important one as well, building skills can actually serve as an insurance policy if things go south in your current role. So by building additional skills, you can continue to contribute to society by providing value to people. And then last but not least, be honest with yourself. Some people will be a better fit for entrepreneurship and for others, a nine to five job is the better fit. There's no right or wrong. It's all about finding the right fit for you. So that was it for today. Thank you so much for listening. It really means a lot to me. Make sure you subscribe in Apple Podcast. And of course, please do not hesitate to contact me. If you have any questions or feedback, send me an email, john at johnnytalks.com or connect through social media at Johnny Talks on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And amigos, once more, thanks so much for listening and I'll speak to you next time.